Well, good afternoon and welcome to another Clearwater Jazz Holiday Foundation's Young Lion Jazz Master Virtual Sessions. Today's educator is Mark Feynman and his topic is exploring creativity and artistic growth. Uh, just a reminder, participants are muted upon entry and during the master class. We appreciate your cooperation to remain muted for the concern, courtesy of others. If you have any specific questions, please feel free to use the chat feature in the toolbox or ask a question and an educator will try to reserve some time to answer questions near the end. Uh, we hope you enjoy today's sessions and don't forget, more upcoming free sessions will be posted at www.clearwaterjazz.com slash education. And remember your feedback and any future session topic suggestions are welcome. So please email us at info at clearwaterjazz.com. We want to thank our sponsors. Uh, also, please be sure to check out the studio archive of past video sessions at clearwaterjazz.com's education outreach section brought to you by Blue Water Wealth Management at Stewart Partners and Duke Energy, as well as our Young Line podcast available wherever you stream. Brought to you by our friends at Marine Max Clearwater. Search Young Lines Jazz Master Virtual Session. So, once again, we have a favorite here, <laughs> Mr. Mark Fleming. Uh, he is back again to give us another awesome, awesome section. Um, and we're, we're excited. Uh, just a little bit about some of the past sessions that we've had with Mark. Uh, history of rhythm section and collaboration coordinate system a rhythmic guide to creativity i know that was a great one playing better with brushes how when why and where <laughs> <laughs> and mark has been a regular participant at our what i love about series i love those as well uh just a little bit more about him um he's part of this great great group out of tampa bay called la lucha their music ventures into a wide variety of musical styles uh, and offers a fun mix of genre under the jazz umbrella. Don't forget, you can also check out their music at www.laluchamusic.com, and you can get more information and about their albums. Uh, a little bit about Mark. He's a drummer. How did you guess? Composer, educator, who is inspired by individual human experiences and a diverse range of musical influences. He has extensive performance experience playing with many wonderful musicians. Uh, he is also a drum set instructor at St. Petersburg College. And we want to thank you for being here, Mark. And guess what? The stage is all yours. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you to everybody at the Clearwater Jazz Education Outreach and Young Lions. I say this every time, it really is a pleasure to be here getting to uh, speak about music and talk to other artists. And uh, I really enjoy checking out the videos as well and learning so much. So it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I've done a lot of different classes. And my, my dog Frida's here today. She is very much awake, so she'll be joining throughout. Um, and you might hear her, as you probably have heard on many Zoom calls at this point of, of uh, the last five years of this last year we've been in. So uh, in my last few classes, I've done the What I Love About series, where I'm talking about artists and uh, their creative endeavors and what they've done professionally. I've also talked about specific things musically, uh, including like the triplets, uh, like items in learning about how to play music, brushes in particular. This is a bigger, more broad topic. Uh, we're going to talk about creativity, uh, exploring creativity, what it means, where to find it, what is it, how do I think about creativity, and artistic growth. Um, I think those are related. I think they're also not related. I, I think I'll contradict myself throughout this, but I think we'll uh, hopefully learn a lot through this process. And I've taken a lot of notes myself about 
uh, this topic. I'm learning a lot about it, and I want to share with you uh, some of the things that uh, I know and love. Uh, first off, what I will say is, I'm during this process of creativity, there's so many ways to go about it, to read about it, to listen about it. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm, uh, I can only tell you what you can do. And these are things that I've done. Uh, and I'll, I'll, let, I'll, I'll tell you when it's something that I've done and I've explored in creativity and when it's something, something that I'm thinking about or I've read about. Um, there's so many wonderful resources out there, um, not just musicians, but in kind of all forms of media, even in sports and athletes. I'm just kind of obsessed with high performers, people that perform at a high level and uh, how they put that into their work and how they use that creativity to put back into the growth of what they want to do. Um, so we're gonna take a look at a lot of different things. Uh, I normally have a really in-depth PowerPoint Today it's gonna to be a little more simple and I'm gonna go ahead and share that and we'll just dive right in. We might be all over the place, that's okay. So let's start with, it may be a definition. Boring, right? So here is Wikipedia. Wikipedia says, <laughs> creativity is a phenomenon by which something new and somehow valuable is formed. Nobody can find, like, an, nobody can agree on what is creativity. And Wikipedia is a crowd-sourced website. So creativity is a phenomenon by which something new and somehow valuable is formed. Sure, I don't know if I agree. Let's figure out why I don't agree. Well, let me look at my notes here. Uh, does it have to be that something is new? Or is it just new to the person that's making it? Does that make sense? It doesn't have to be new. It's just, you know, you might have just discovered this when you were in second grade, but it's been discovered for millions of years. And the same goes for the idea of value, somehow something valuable is formed. Uh, depending on who you are, when you are, where you are, value can change wildly. And so another thing about this definition of it being a phenomenon, creativity, uh, the definition focuses on things that are formed rather than the creative themselves. And today I really want to focus on the person that is creating, which is you, me, somebody, whoever, whoever wants to create. And so with the help of Questlove, a wonderful drummer and all around amazing artist of many things, uh, creativity is the personality that makes it possible that something new and somehow valuable is formed. The personality, this is what Questlove says. And I like this, it's uh, not really about letting everything in, but it's about refusing to keep things out. We're gonna take a look at different ways. Uh, another definition is a creative person, and it should be a creative person is, not us, Creative person is a person that creates. Simple. Creative person is a person that creates. Let's take a look at this as like a metaphor. Creativity is a fire. It starts with a spark. I like this one. And it always starts with a spark. Just that little idea, just that nudge, that something that gets you to want to continue in an exploration. Sometimes you don't know that you're being creative. You're not even sure that you're being creative until the project or something that you're doing is over. Uh, sometimes you're doing something, and let's, I'm gonna use metaphors or analogies to music because uh, we're speaking through the Clearwater Jazz Education Outreach and they work in the jazz genre. So let's say you're practicing and you come to an impasse, something 
something you're stuck um you have to figure out how to get out of that you have to do something different you can't just get stuck every time and this happens in in different forms you know maybe you're stuck because uh you can't get past so we're going to take a look at different ways in which that that happens uh we're going to come back to that don't deny your creativity doth protest too much that's what Gertrude says in uh, Hamlet. Hamlet's mother says this. Uh, it's a Shakespeare play. This is actually a line that's said inside the play of Hamlet. It's a wonderful read, tragic. Um, but you protest too much. That's why I say to people who are saying they deny their creativity. They say, oh, I don't have anything to say. I don't, I'm, I'm not creative. I don't come up with original ideas. Usually those people are wildly creative. They're coming up with ideas. They just don't know it yet. Doth protest too much. It's a great play, you should read it. Ah, here's one way. The rings of challenge. <laughs> this is how I sort of think of creativity, but it's also how I think of getting yourself into um, getting yourself past that impasse discovering the physical emotional and conceptual side of creativity or just in general if we take out the word creativity let's say you want to learn something new or uh, let's take jazz let's use jazz as an example here um, this is this is actually something I heard in a class with a drummer named Jojo Meyer. Um, and he talks about these three rings based off of uh, the drummer John Bonham. John Bonham has a, a logo and it's these three rings. And he said he, uh, you know what, why don't I read the quote and then we'll kind of explore it a little bit. And we'll take a little example on how you can use this rings of challenge uh, with yourself or your students or somebody else or a creative project in order to kind of break through to get to that middle that middle part right in there okay this is Jojo Mayer on greatness the three levels of circles of challenge those three circles I see as the physical or technical world or the body the conceptual world or the mind, the choices, and the emotional world. These are the areas where the three overlap, but you can also separate them. Now let's say there's a drummer who's ready to emote and share their feelings, but is technically unable to execute their ideas. They're going to be frustrated. Now let's say there's a drummer who uh, I'm using drummer, I'm a drummer, I'll just say drummer or artist. There's a musician who has meticulous understanding of the physics of their instrument and have a very good concept, but they can't emote. They don't have the emotional side. They'll be only interested in those, that instrument they play. They'll only be interested as in two other drummers. They're probably gonna be a clinician. Uh, they're doing incredible things, but, you know, only a drummer's drummer. Okay, then maybe you have the technical um, or the body side, the physical, and you're ready to emote, but you have no uh, concept. So you're a clone of somebody else who's already out there, and you're going to miss authenticity, which is, which is really important to, you know, music. So you have to allow yourselves to be honest and aware of our emotions. We want to share these things with someone new, uh, with someone else. So we have to put them in some sort of structure so people can understand it. And then we need the, techni the technique to do it. So uh, in the process, you make acquisitions of knowledge. Okay, this goes on and on. It, it goes pretty deep and it can be somewhat boring. Sorry, Jojo. It's, it's interesting, but let's take an example. You have a friend and you're like, hey, I play jazz. And they're like, oh, they're a musician. And they say, I hate jazz. Okay. You don't have to change their mind, but let's figure out maybe why. 
why do they hate jazz? Well, maybe they're a really good musician at what they do, and they just don't understand it, right? They don't have the emotional uh, they, a connection to it. Okay, so you check out, you, you know, you show them some recordings and they're like, wow, like, I really can hear what Coltrane is saying. I really dig that. Like, this speaks to me. Okay, good. You have the red and the blue, physical and emotional, you know, or, or, or rather, the physical side is actually playing jazz. They don't understand what a bebop scale is, right? So we have to connect it. If they say they hate it, we have to connect all three to get to that middle. So emotionally, wow, I really dig this recording. Coltrane, Mingus, this is great. Oh, something modern, maybe the Bad Plus or Snarky Puppy. This is something that's that I can relate to. Okay, now there's the physical. Well, I, I hate it because I don't know how to play it. Okay, so you show them. Well, this scale is not too far off from playing jazz. My dog, Frida, is, is, is involved today. I apologize. <laughs> she's blind and deaf, and so she's just, sometimes she's just not sure. So you show them, hey, dig this scale, change this one note, or actually check out this rhythm that you can play with one note or two notes. Now they're understanding, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about making mistakes. I can just go with the flow. So they're physically understanding how jazz works. Same thing with a drummer. Oh, you know what? My technique is off. But I, you learn how to do something simply. Now you're starting to get it. And you're like, ah, oh, this makes sense. My feel, it's feeling better. So you listen to the music. Now I don't understand how it works, the concept right? Sort of like Halloween. You mean they're just giving out candy? Who are these people giving out? Everybody's giving out candy. You can just go to door to door and knock on somebody's door and they're going to give you candy. This, I love it, you know? <laughs> so once you understand how this works, may not want to knock on somebody's door another time of the year and ask for candy, but that one day of year, it's cool. It's a little different now. Okay, so you have these three rings. When all of these combine, you have accepted this challenge. You have gained knowledge. You have, you're allowing yourself to open yourself to some sort of creativity. There's no, there's no more protesting involved. Let's take, let's go deeper. <laughs> the, the hierarchy of competence. This is a, a, soci, a sociality, a, 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 what I'm getting my name, my, a, a psychology uh, term. The hierarchy of competence. Okay, don't be scared, okay? This is, this is actually pretty cool. A great way of looking at this is uh, we're going to take a musician maybe from when you start beginning to, you know, professional. Okay. So on the very, very bottom, the bottom of this pyramid is unconscious incompetence. We're going to talk about this in terms of practicing or learning music. So when you first start playing music or have the idea of playing music, or it could be just something new in this art that you're doing. It's unconscious incompetent. You're bad and you don't understand why you're bad. <laughs> you might not even think that you're bad on this instrument. It can be frustrating, but once you figure it out, once you figure it out that you're bad at this instrument, you've made it to step two. Conscious incompetence. Now you know that you're bad and you know why that you're bad at this instrument. I don't, I don't want to call anybody bad. I'm just saying that you are not as competent on your, your, your incompetent at your instrument or what you're working toward. So now you know that you're bad and you know, uh, you might not have the skill, but you know what you have to do to get better. 
And this is usually where you get a teacher or an educator, where you start taking classes. And this teacher is there because they know how to find and help with those issues. And there are really great educators out there that won't do it by saying no or slapping your hand or something like that. That's, that shouldn't happen at all. But they will help you and correct the things that are needed. Hey, maybe put your hands like this. Maybe move your mouth in this direction so you can get the air out. Sit up straight. Let's hold the stick like this. They're helping you. And this means that you're growing and you're changing and change is painful. This is a really hard part to get out of because anytime you change or you're growing as an artist, it's, it's difficult or at least it's difficult to me. Things never came easy to me. From reading a book to picking up sticks and trying something new, um, you know, or just technology in general, these, these things are, are difficult for me, but I power through or I find somebody to help me and I learn and you grow. And as soon as you're growing, boom, next level into the green conscious competence. You might have some problems still as a, as a musician or artist or on a piece of music you're working on, but you know how to deal with this. This is usually what happened to this is usually what happens once you're kind of in college. Right. We can think of this as elementary the middle high school is kind of the yellow conscious incompetence. You're learning a lot. You're in college. There's a you know, you set your own times to practice. Um, you still have some problems, but you know how to deal with it. This is where you're spending a lot of time in the practice room. You know, you have to do these skills. You know that you have to do these breathing exercises. It takes time and you're practicing and you know why. I have this recital, I have this concert, I have a recording project with a friend or, or something, and you're practicing toward that. Okay, so eventually you, you're doing these things over and over again and you get to the next phase, which is where a lot of professionals are which is unconscious competence in the blue, the top of this diamond. This is the most dangerous stage. <laughs> you might be thinking, I've made it. This is it. But no, 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 no. This is, this is, this is dangerous because, well, first of all, let me just say that unconscious competence is where you can perform or create or play a gig and you can do another task at the same time, talking to your friend, saying, hey, yeah, I, I want this, or you're taking in you know, a request or something, and, uh, or you're able to discuss the song while you're playing. You're playing at a high level, and you're able to talk to somebody at that moment. It happens all the time on a gig where somebody comes up and they say, hey, they want to request a song, or you know what, it's, hey, it's my friend David's birthday, can you wish them happy birthday? This happens on like, some gigs, or at least it happened when there were gigs. Um, this is where playing becomes effortless. This is like the effortless mastery that Kenny Warner uh, speaks about. The reason this is dangerous is this becomes, this is what, where procedural learning happens. Procedural learning is learning by repeating complex activity until your brain automates it. You're creating implicit memory, memory that does not require conscious thought. And why is this dangerous? Because you can easily start moving backwards. I'm not thinking about what I have to do, therefore my hand is getting lazy when I'm playing the ride symbol. Or my hi-hat, I'm not thinking about it, I know it can step on two and four playing anything, but I'm stepping too loud or I'm not stepping enough. I'm unconscious to things that are happening. Oh, I'm just, I'm missing notes in this melody because I'm not thinking about it. You might know that you missed the note, but the more times you miss that note, it becomes a part of what you're doing. Something as simple as not closing your computer 
you know, if you're a DJ and you're not, com com you know, closing your computer the right way or closing down a program before you put it away, it, you're going to lose all your files at some point or your computer might error. Okay. Another thing about this level is something that's called body mapping. That's not a lot of research on body mapping that I personally could find, but let me explain it like this. And this is this is this is really where we do want to be, but understanding where we are. Body mapping is when you say, I want to play this note, G. Boom, you play the note G. Easy, said, and done. You've practiced it over and over again. But what you're not doing is you're not thinking, okay, in order to play the note G on trumpet, I have to press the, my finger down. Therefore, I have to move this muscle. And as I'm doing that, the air has to go through the horn, and I have to produce it in such a way and move my jaw this way, and I have to sit up straight. All of these min, you know, tiny little things that have to happen to produce the note. No, it just you are the note G. Boom, I can do it. This is actually how um, like blind musicians, Stevie Wonder, Ray Charles, how they were able, they mapped, they sort of somewhat visually felt mapped the notes out. They know where the notes are in front of them in, on any kind of keyboard instrument. They've mapped it into their body and feeling of that, boom, I can do that. You talk about musicians sound the way they do, you know, same piano, a hundred different pianists, they have their sound and feel because they've their body has mapped how it feels to play a note. Even though it's the same instrument, the same piano, every pianist will sound the way they sound on that instrument. Let's use an analogy of driving a car. Maybe you don't drive a car, but somebody who does. When you have to, you know, let's say you're gonna turn left. You say, I have to turn left. I, it's the car that's turning left. Not you, but you say I. But it, whoa, he got really close to me. Well, you got really close to the car, but we see ourselves as the car, we are, We've mapped ourselves as this vehicle. So yeah, that top part is it's become second nature. Okay, let's move on from hierarchy of competence. Unconstrained originality. This is another definition for creativity. There's the good side and the bad side. You know what? This part can get long-winded and boring. We're going to move forward. Where do you find creativity? <laughs> the Cave of Wonders from Aladdin. That's that's where you find it. No, no. Um, well, uh, there's three places that I use as the diving board. So three diving boards. Inspiration, motivation, and challenge. I use these, th these three things to help me uh, find creativity. Okay, well, how do I, how am I inspired? How am I motivated? How am I challenged? Let me list a few things that I've done that might help you. Um, reading, reading a book. I'm not saying reading about creativity. That's great. You can read about creativity. <laughs> you know, I, I, I want, for us, I, as a side note, I want to say there are a lot of books on creativity that talk about a secret or tapping into a secret. There are no secrets. <laughs> uh, it may not even be, you know, programmatic. There's no, there's no program that says this is what you need to do to be creative. Um, I personally don't have any secrets. I only have stories and experiences of what worked and what didn't work. So 
sometimes reading, reading a book, reading a book on fiction, reading an autobiography, being inspired by somebody else's experience or their stories can be uh, inspirational. Uh, listening, listening to music, listening to a podcast, listening to something that you may not normally listen to. You might find something in there, find that spark, right? So let's always talk about that spark. I'll, I'll try to bring that back. The best way to learn is by listening. You can ask a lot of questions, but if you don't listen, you're not going to learn. Listening to somebody else and allowing space. Let's use let's use an actual direct analogy to listening, which could be you're on a, a gig or you're on a recording session and there's a brand new song that somebody brought in. You didn't get to practice it enough. You have never heard it. Whatever it is, it's a new piece of music and the person hired you to be creative and bring all that you have to this gig. And now it's time for you to solo. <laughs> It's kind of scary because you're not sure what to do. Well, what I would do and what I have done is sometimes I just, it's okay to stop and listen. It might feel like an eternity, but maybe it's just a few seconds, even five seconds is a lot. And just listen, what's happening? What can I do in this space? Ah, I heard a rhythmic thing. Well, I'm not really sure how to play over this chord change. I'm not really sure what, how to play in this time signature, but I can listen and I can just feel my way through it. Ah, somebody brought an idea. Let me use that idea as, uh, as a diving board into something that I can do. I know I can play rhythmically. Let me just play one or two notes rhythmically. So listening is really, really, really important watching something. If I'm having trouble finding, cre you know, being creative or working on a project or writing a new song, or I'm, I watch, I watch a musician and I feel motivated or challenged. Let me figure that out now. Or watch a movie or a TV show. Let's say I'm just stuck. I really want to write a new song. I'm just not sure. I watch a show or a movie. You know what? This is giving me an idea. This is helping me. Maybe I want to write a song about this movie because it's so dope, you know? A actively learning activity, learning a new language, taking a class, something that you're just not thinking about, oh, you know, I want to create. No, just learn. It might actually, you know, the neurons might pop in your head and put the pieces together. Speaking of pieces together, playing. And I don't mean just playing on your instrument for fun. That's something good to do. Improvising and just exploring the instrument in a new way is really fun and a great way to you know, be creative. But what I mean is playing a game, playing something. Uh, an example is I have a, a young daughter who's just over a year and a half old and she loves playing with blocks. And just today, we were playing with blocks on the floor, and we were building up a tower really high. And I found myself diving into her world of imagination and creativity and humming and singing along with whatever it is that she had. Even at her age, she's being somewhat creative. But this tower is huge. And so sometimes the tower falls. And when the tower falls, not all the pieces fall apart onto the ground. Sometimes there's two or three pieces left there. Sometimes there's one piece all spread all over the place. And I find that myself or she will pick up those two or three pieces together and use that as the next building block. So sometimes something that falls apart, you can use pieces of that to create something new. 
just playing. I like to doodle as well when I'm talking, and sometimes just the doodling, it's sort of uh, meditative, which brings me to my next one, some sort of physical activity or non-physical physical activity, like meditation, yoga, exercise, some kind of movement. If I'm sitting and I'm trying to write something, I'm working on a piece of music and it's just not coming out, I'm not, you know, sometimes you just need to get up and move and just find a new environment to be in. So that brings me to my next one, space, environment, travel. Now we're not all traveling, actually we're all doing hopefully the opposite. We are in one space for quite a long time. And sometimes that can feel hindering, but you can find new and ways to be creative in your space. I am fortunate that I have a backyard and I have a front yard and I can go to my backyard with a pencil and paper, or I might not bring my full drum set out there, but I can bring my computer. I can bring my guitar and I can be in a new space, be in a new environment. Um, if you've seen my classes, I often do these in new spaces. Sometimes I'm sitting at the desk, and sometimes I'm sitting in front of the desk. Sometimes I'm sitting in front of the bookshelf or sitting on the couch or in my room. A new environment welcomes new opportunities. Something uh, that I like to do is the organization of my space. Something new I've been working on is only having on my desk what I need because sometimes it just gets cluttered and that's just me. Finding inspiration, something I mentioned, I mentioned a few different instruments. Working on another instrument. If you're a composer, you may want to explore many instruments. And I don't mean you are extremely competent. You're going through that high, you know, hierarchy of of competence with all those instruments. No, you're, you can just explore. I'm not an amazing guitarist, but I love to play the guitar and find new sounds on it, find melody or chords that just place my hands. I love placing my hands on the piano without thinking what is this chord and then figuring out what that sound is. And then an hour later, I'm in this whole new world of sound. If you do not play the drums, I highly suggest getting a pair of drumsticks and just playing rhythmically or buying a cowbell or, you know, just exploring rhythm and tone without the full spectrum of all the notes. This can lead to amazing creative ideas. Collaboration is huge. Collaboration and community. Well, let's talk about, though they're similar, but they're different. Let's talk about collaboration, collaborating with somebody else. You both want to create a project together. Well, uh, this actually brings us back to kind of unconstrained originality, which is you are pulling somebody else into your project, or they're, they're pulling you into theirs. So how can you be creative together? Do you have to be on the same page? Well. It's somewhat, it's kind of cool when you have uh, a difference in creative ideas and finding that place where it meets, where this new idea that you may not have thought of or an idea that you have, they've able to lift it up. Hey, I have this idea, I'm just not sure how to make it happen. Well, their idea, they say, well, maybe let's, let's try this. Um, just being on board and trusting each other. I'm going to share a project of collaboration in, in just a moment that I that I worked on, and things that worked and things that didn't work. Community. When you, uh, I, when I have ideas, I, I I'm I'm not big on social media and going asking the question, but I actually have a small group of friends. Some of them are in La Lucha, Alejandro and John. And when I'm stuck on an idea or when I have a crazy idea or when I just want to talk something through, 
I run this by them. I also have an extremely creative partner, Gloria Munoz, and she helps me figure out how to get somewhere with an idea. You know, she might say, hey, marinate on this. This is good. Or you know what? This is, I think we can find a way. Let's, or, you know, maybe that's not good. <laughs> this has been done, but has it been done? And, you know, how can we do it a different way? So finding someone that you can talk to, you can rant to, you can just, hey, you know, you've listened to them, let them just talk to you. Sometimes I'll just call my friends and say, hey, I need to talk this through out loud. I just need like a human body. Um, I know you might be busy, just, just, you know, let's talk, okay? So to run through that list, listening, reading, exploring, traveling, and changing your environment, playing, watching, learning actively, collaborating, uh, some sort of physical exercise and meditation, a yoga, uh, talking, community, and collaborating. And I mentioned improvisation. Improvisation is a wonderful way to just explore and figure something out, out and all of those are somewhat involved in there. Feeling stuck? Yep, it happens. It certainly feels like I'm not creative. I don't know what to do. Going back to the unconstrained originality, sometimes you feel stuck because you're in somebody else's project and they've not given you the rules. I don't know when the deadline is. I don't know how to complete this task. I don't know what to do. Okay, well, sometimes you just feel stuck. Now, let me, let me share this. Every idea that you have does not need to be the idea. It does not need to be, this is the project that I have. There was a conversation um, at the 92nd Street Y a couple of years ago um, that when I was in New York, uh, I got to attend it and it was Malcolm Gladwell. And he said about being stuck or not running out of ideas. I'm really paraphrasing because I don't remember very much. But he never runs out of ideas. It's, it's just that not every idea is the idea. It's not always the book. He's refining and defining things all the time. He's going back to little, little two words that he's wrote, written in a notebook and just meditated on that. Um, so there's a lot of ways to get out of feeling stuck. All the ways I just mentioned of finding creativity could help you get out of a, of a rut. Um, so let me share a personal experience, which is the time that we're in is not a I'm a performing musician time. On March 15th was my last gig and I've played very few, most of them online. So I kind of felt stuck. Okay, well, I'm not a performing musician right now, but I am a musician. I'm feeling, you know, that I have things that I want to say or do. Now, they're not always being shared, um, but I, in order for me as a musician, I need to connect with other people to, you know, to put something out there, be creative, right? Um, and don't always worry about being creative. Oh, you know, I am creative, I'm a creative person. If you feel that you're a creative person, put on a beret and walk around and let people know. But that's, like I said, you may not even know you're being creative until after you've created. So feeling stuck, I had no gigs, let's say that. Well, I really wanted to create music. I feel that it's, it's a very big part of what I do. It's also my business and what I do. So um, one, there's nothing wrong with not doing what you do. Meaning, 
if you want to work somewhere else, that is awesome. Some people who work in another profession from what they do, uh, they find so much more creativity or ideas when they are doing their passion or doing a creative project or feeling creative somewhere else, gardening, cooking. So I wanted to work in the music business still. So I made a list of things that might still work while in quarantine. And one of those was something that I've kind of dabbled in, which is one songwriting, composing, um, doing sound design, any kind of project. And I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, what, what are those? Those are film. While they're closing all, you know, studios, I have to. So animation, animation is one place that I began working in, not as an animator, but in the music side of that. Um, my partner Gloria and I happen to have a songwriting business, writing music uh, or scores or creating music in commercials. And we we're also doing sound design. Uh, meaning sound effects or sound, you know, like somebody walking or things in commercials. So we began reaching out to uh, other creatives who might be looking for other people to collaborate with or to hire. And we found ourselves with a lot of work um, or larger projects, maybe not a lot of work, but a lot a larger projects over a span of, a span of time and I was able to find a new and pivot somewhat. And I got to learn a lot. I got to be creative by making cool and new sounds. Uh, and I found that I got to be creative in a new way. But then when I was doing the performing aspect, it felt amazing because I wasn't inside that kind of world and painting of performing and practicing all the time. Uh, let's take a look at a different way on how to get out from feeling stuck. Negative theology. Oh, that sounds boring. Ugh. Negative theology. Okay, it gets better. <laughs> I don't think that I'm a very spiritual or somewhat you know, religious person, but I will quote Maimonides. <laughs> Negative theology comes from Maimonides, the concept of knowing God only by what you can say that God is not. Another way to say this is carve out the negative space around your idea. We're not using, you know, this is not a negative connotation, no pun intended. Let, let me quote David Byrne, who is the leader of uh, the Talking Heads, a very cool band from the 80s. And he's done a lot of really awesome creative projects through his career, including a really cool book on uh, what is music, how to make music, how to, something about music. Don't imagine what you will become. Imagine what you won't become. It helps to reinforce which parts of your creative identity you can't live without and which might be there only because you've been told by someone else that they should be there. Imagining what you won't become is a necessary refining process. I love this. Make a list of things that you don't want to become for your project. You don't want your project to be. If it's a project or if you're writing a song, what I don't want the song to be about. I want it to be about love, but I don't want to use the word love. But I also don't want it to sound like I'm talking about love. It's an idea. OK, let's talk about a project that I worked on. Um, it's a project called See, Hear, Feel. Um, I received a grant. Uh, from the studio at 620 through the Doris Duke Charitable, Charitable Foundation. And I chose to do this project as a collaboration with the group that I'm in, La Lucha. And the project 
was this. It came out of lots of conversations, especially with our pianist, John O'Leary. John O'Leary, um, you may have seen him in other videos here on the outreach, the Young Lion sessions. Uh, he has a PhD in neurological sciences studying Alzheimer's research, and uh, he wanted to find a way to advocate and talk about Alzheimer's, but through the arts. So he had this idea that we were able to come to fruition, which is collaborate with a poet, a painter, and through music, and give an experience into a world. We created nine art pieces that when you walked up, there's a set of headphones on the wall, and we had composed nine pieces of music for each of these photographs and poem. Now the the whole thing is is you know the chicken or the egg, the cart before the horse. What is you know what's what came first? Well, we found a way to all collaborate together, which was we got together. Um, the photographer, the poet, Gloria Munoz, Rossi Newsom, and La Lucha, and we came, talked about some ideas. We talked about the project. What is this theme about? What is the feeling of the project? What's the aesthetic? Do we want it to be fun? Do we want it to be serious? Do we want it to be sad, uplifting? We wanted all stories related to Alzheimer's from the patient, from the family, from the caretaker, everyone involved. And each of these stations told a story and brought you into this world. And you can be in this world by reading the poem only, looking at the photo only, listening to the music only, or doing any of these at the same time. And we also had a live performance aspect at the end of every evening that this was performed. And we were able to vocally speak about and each of the artists performing live. So this was a new way of performing for people. Here's everybody involved. And June Bustamante was also involved, a wonderful singer-songwriter in the Tampa Bay area. And the idea was how to get this off the ground. Right? There were so many aspects to this. There was the actual making of the music, the let's all talk about this and who does what. There is the, okay, when does, what's our deadline? We have to get these printed. We have to get these on the wall. Who puts them on the wall? <laughs> How do we get the headphones? Where do we get nine iPods? Do we need extra? Do we need extra headphones in case they break? Where do we promote it? There was all these things. And La Lucha talks about this. We're going to talk about this a little bit more actually next week in the class on how to be a band and how to put together a project or come to fruition. But the idea of creativity was that I wanted to surround myself with a community and collaborate with people that were one, better than me, two, had different ideas than me, three, that could lift me up and make me feel like I'm doing the best that I can do and come up with creative problem solvings to things that, ha that happened or that were happening. And everybody getting onto the same page. And if we weren't on the same page, maybe something came out of that. So that was see, hear, feel. And you know, if you have any questions on that, I'm happy to take you know, questions and we can dive further into that. If there are questions, please feel free to ask. You can, you can cut me off at whenever. I do need to check my time because I know I'm going somewhat over, which I am. Uh, this image here is actually from a recent project um, that I'm currently working on. It is a pilot for a animation. It's an anime animation. Um, and it's 13 minutes, a 13 minute pilot. And this is from the Q scoring session where I sat down with the director and we talked about every place that needed a sound cue. I wasn't making the music. I wasn't writing the score, the actual 
you know, music for it. I was making the sounds. So this was a different way of being creative for me and my wife, Gloria. We are making sounds for this animation. And it says 160, but end up being about 175 different sound cues. Everything from walking to uh, broken glass to an explosion to laser sounds. We really had a great time. It was really fun being creative and figuring out how we're going to make this happen. How do we make a laser sound like it's in a warehouse? So this is a, a picture of each one of these were, if you zoomed in, each one of these were labeled with what the sound needed to be, where it needs to be, how long it needs to be. This might have been my last slide. So I'll stop share. Wow, what is I want to talk. Question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 are, is there a question? Because I can, I can dive into like one five more, five more minutes. Well, um, yeah, it was a question. Uh, we always hear yeah. about uh, when you talk about creativity. Uh, one of my favorite uh, jazz greats is Louis Armstrong, and we always hear about he had no barrier between his imagination and what he could play out of his horn. Oh, yeah. How does one develop creativity like that, especially as a jazz musician where we know there's theory to this and things like that, but yeah. how do you just break that barrier of, I hear this in my head and I want to get it outside of my body, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Isn't that, that's the dream, right? This is, this is where we talk about music as a language and uh, that the words that I'm speaking, I may have never said these words or sentences before, but I'm able to produce them out of my mouth, kind of. Uh, and that's what we'd like to do on our instruments or any project. We want it to be a clear, here's what I'm saying and here's how I feel. And so what's in here comes out and on to here. So it is, it is a complete collaboration of uh, practicing your instrument in such a way that you are able to get out what you want to say. Now, there's this kind of myth of, you know, when I'm creating or when I'm improvising, all of these things just come out. Well, there are some musicians that say, that it's kind of baloney because when you practice so much, you start, it's like a puzzle, right? When you're putting together a puzzle, the pieces go into and they fit in such a way that the more times you do this puzzle, it works. I wish that if you put the puzzle in different ways, it would create another picture, but this is actually how jazz works. You can take these ideas that you're practicing and put them in different places I know what this thing that I want to say sounds like. This sentence and these words together create this emotional idea. Over a fast song, it might sound different than when you're playing it over a slow song. So I would say practice with conscious so you know what you're practicing so that when you want to put it out there in the world, you know that you are going to play that. What I can say is I practice my technique and my coordination so that I'm able to pull something out creatively, creatively, right? And I can do it very quickly. So in my personal practice, I'm doing things consistently over and over again so that when I want to respond to something that's happening on the bandstand, I'm able to do it very quickly without thinking, can I say this? Because it's something that I may have said before, or my skill level, my technique is so together that it's very comfortable when I can get that out. But a lot of the times I have repeated myself and that's okay because in front of new audiences or in new environments or at a new song, a new tempo, at a new time, it feels different. I don't always have to go around saying new words every single day. I can say the same words in different ways with different inflection. 
Um, if you listen over the span of Louis Armstrong's recordings, you can hear some of the same ideas or licks, his emotion, what he has to say, his words. So I think he taps into that feeling of, here's what I want to say, and I'm able to do it because I've said it in different ways. I hope that answers the question. Yes, that was an awesome answer, awesome answer. Here's another point that came up. It sure. was about motivation. Uh, thank you for talking about um, motivation that kind of helped you get through the current pandemic. There's yeah. a lot of professional musicians that had to get very creative. And this was maybe a negative source of motivation, but it forced us to uh, create new, new, uh, income, new levels of income, new things to yeah. survive. And sometimes survival is a motivator. Um, also yeah. talked about collaboration and in community. That was awesome. And whether you're a young musician or a seasoned musician, uh, I feel like that collaboration can always inspire you to go that next step. You know, we've seen younger musicians, they hear an expert musician and they're just like, wow, how did you do that? And immediately they go home and start practicing because they heard Mark Feynman on the drums. Or <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And in addition to that, I want to say two things. One is it's okay to not feel creative or that you don't want to do something. This is an extremely vulnerable time and sometimes you just don't feel motivated. And it doesn't mean you always have to create because you somebody said that you're a creator. Um, you know, for me personally, because it, you know, I make money doing this. I continue to stay and find ways to make that happen. Um, but if you don't feel it, it's okay. Uh, you don't have to always put things out there. You can talk about being, you know, a creative project. You can write down ideas. I feel that I'm less on my instrument. I'm definitely less on my instrument, but I'm doing something else out. I'm writing down I'm somewhat journaling ideas. And that's it makes me feel creative. It makes me feel good that I'm just involved in that world or I'm listening to a lot of music and new music. And it just makes me feel involved, even though I'm personally may not be putting out as much stuff. And the other thing that I do want to say related to that as well is the idea of time. We could dive into routine and and what I do in in having a routine or setting up or my time of day when I wake up and what I do. But what I do want to say is um, how to turn on how to turn on creativity on and off very quickly. Um, I mentioned that Q scoring project and I mentioned having uh, a daughter just over one and a half and scheduling doesn't always allow me to sit down for four to eight hours and create. Nobody's sitting down for eight hours just to write. Nobody can do that. <laughs> it's just, you know, then what do you have to write about? The idea of writing for eight hours, but, ex you know, experiencing other things. But what I want to say is I've had to find new ways to turn on creativity because I have 20 minutes here. I have an hour here in the morning. At night, you know, I'm not great at uh, practicing or creating or writing music at night. Um, but I have to do it. So how do I get myself to do that? Um, well, I'm going to share what I do and I'm going to share what my partner Gloria does. And I, so what I do is if I'm writing, I get myself a glass of water and at my piano, I have a light and I turn the light on. That's it. It means I'm in it and I go. And I don't think what works or what doesn't work. Um, I'm personally writing songs right now for a musical um, that I cannot talk too much about, but I will say that I have to write 18 songs over a period of time, my, myself and Gloria together. 
uh, and I'm writing more than 18 and I'm throwing away a lot of stuff. And if I'm writing a song that I, you know, I'm not feeling or that's bad, I have to finish it. And the reason I have to finish that bad song is because I don't want, and I know this sounds, sound might sound weird, but I don't want, one, I don't want that bad song to creep into the good song that might be next, but also maybe something later on in that bad, bad, bad song will work, right? Those blocks that fell down, I'm picking up pieces and putting them together. Something might work from that. One line, one word, one feeling, the tempo, the harmonic change. So I'm able to turn it on and turn it off quickly by just doing it over and over and over again, which is also creating intuition. What works and what doesn't work, what feels good, what feels right for the moment. Um, so being creative doesn't have to be like, okay, now I sit down and pray and I sage the room and I need to have a clean room. It needs to be four hours. But what I will say is when that's your time, that's your time. Don't go out onto social media, maybe turn your internet off. Let the, let somebody else know, you know, when my partner and I are both, you know, we say we're creatives, we, we both create work. We say, hey, I'm working now, I need this space and time. Sometimes we're working together. Sometimes one of us has a deadline or a project, or we both do, we have to figure out, you know, who's watching a baby. When can we do this? We need to rely on our community. Actually, my father is here in this chat and we are able to depend on him for helping out. So it's okay to reach out and ask for help, but when it comes time to what you want to create, it's time to create. And I know I didn't really hit on artistic growth a lot, but what I will say is all of these things lead to artistic growth and you can see over a period of time how you've grown, listening back, recording yourself. It's not defined by how many followers and likes you have, how much money you've made, how many gigs you have, you know. It's defined by you and maybe some people you can find in with, hey, you know, look at all these things that I've made. Like, I feel that I've grown. I feel like the gigs that I am playing, I'm playing with people that I've wanted to play with. And I did that personally by mapping my practices, by saying, here's where I practiced at this tempo and I did this exercise and now I'm here. I can't believe it. I've gotten better because I've actually written down the date and the time and how fast or how slow or how clean this is. And I have an audio recording of it. I was pretty obsessive about that. Another thing is I mapped out a five-year plan. Everything from what I wanted to do professionally, who I wanted to play with, the venues I wanted to play in, the projects I wanted to create, and at the end of those five years, I looked back and said, wow, I hit these things and more. Or I didn't hit these things. Well, let's work on those. And um, I, I was just very honest with myself or I find other people that are honest with me to make these things happen. Um, I'll simply say this to somebody that's interested in mapping five year. Map, what can you do? You know, let's say you want to get somewhere five years from now. What can you do every year to get to that five years? What can you do every month to make that year happen? What can you do every week? What can you do every day? What can you do hourly? What can you do right now? Maybe it's being here and deciding that I want to create something that I feel proud about and that I feel is worth sharing and valuable. I have a new take on something and I like to grow as a musician 
and being creative helps me grow or being or growing into having more creative ideas. And so that's how I see the map. And I'm more than happy to, if you want to reach out to me, uh, we can talk about that more. I'm happy to share my maps and uh, we can talk about creativity. But that's kind of our, uh, I might say the Cliff Notes version of this very big idea of exploring creativity and your artistic growth. Wow, what a great session, Mark. <laughs> we really enjoyed this one. I mean, there's so much we could say about exploring creativity and artistic growth. We want to thank you for your research, and I'm looking forward to talking about this even more. And I just want to remind everybody, uh, if you want to check out any upcoming free sessions, please go to the website, www.clearwaterjazz.com slash education. If you have any suggestions or any topics, please email us at info at clearwaterjazz.com. Mark, this was phenomenal, and I'm looking forward to the next one. And don't forget, invite other people to hear the great things that's happening here at Clearwater Jazz, and we'll see you at the next one. Thank you, and have a great day. Hey, hey, Mark Feynman. It's Steve Weinberger. How you doing? Doing excellent. Thank you. Hey, I've been in the I've been in the background uh, listening along during uh, the session today. I, I uh, just wanted to say uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're off to a great start with 2021, and we owe a lot to you for that. Uh, you've done some great sessions so far, including today. I think this is going to be a wonderful addition to the studio. And I can't thank you enough for continuing to believe in the mission of Clearwater Jazz Holiday Education and Outreach. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here. I look forward to more sessions and being back soon. Cool. And I, I want to give a shout out to Michael Kernuddle. Thank you for being a great host in these uh, recently, Michael. And uh, for those of you following along, be sure to stay in touch with us. Visit clearwaterjazz.com, go to the studio, watch the sessions, go to the podcast, listen to the sessions. Thanks for everyone who's been supporting these, and we'll see you all back real soon. Take care, Mark. Bye.